Oh boy, I got a box from Cathode Corner. It is my Nixie watch, the round style. So called NWRG. Comes with a small user manual, two spare burrows Nixie tubes. It's these little guys here. It's the B57, I'm sorry, B5870. And then there's an ST after it, made in England. With the leads more or less formed, or at least cut to length, for the uh, the sockets they go into in this particular product. So I gotta keep those somewhere safe. I had ordered the two spares. And here is the watch itself with the crystal front window, the hard anodized black case, it's serial numbered, and um, it has sort of a um, rubber, silicone rubber kind of uh, strap, very flexible, feels reasonably strong. And it comes with a CR2 lithium cell, which is supposed to last for at least four months of regular use of the watch. Of course, most of the depletion is when you fire it up to activate the Nixie tubes, which are only on for a few seconds um, at certain times. The Nixie watch is water resistant and rugged. The long life, readily available battery may be changed without tools. Watch requires no button pushing to operate. It shows the hours, minutes, and seconds in sequence at the flick of a wrist. It provides a bit of theater with every reading. The watch features 12 or 24 hour time display mode, user settable tilt angle, and easy time setting operation. The timekeeping rate is adjustable, and the watch comes pre-adjusted to within a few seconds a week. The two Nixie tubes are widely available B5870 type, and are socketed for easy replacement in case of damage. The tubes have a 0.6 inch tall digit per tube for easy reading in adverse conditions. Opening the case by unscrewing the rib cover reveals the time setting buttons, the battery, and the tubes. The case is made of strong, lightweight aircraft aluminum, hard anodized for lasting beauty. The rear of the case is gently contoured for comfort in all day use. An O-ring seal keeps out water, dust, and dirt. The strap is a standard 20 millimeter size. The weight is 2 ounces. Uh, battery life 4 to 6 months at 50 viewings a day. Takes a CR2 lithium battery which is 3 volts 750 milliamp -hour hours so there's what the cover unscrewed got the two Nixie tubes in their little sockets there's the master or main circuit board down at the bottom with lots of surface mount parts on it it looks like there might be some sort of a pad that the tubes rest against I assume their front sides are up against the crystal. There's the battery holder and another circuit board. That one may have the PIC processor on it. Um, and then there's another circuit board which has the two push buttons for control. The two buttons are the set button, which changes the mode, cycles through the modes. And the other button is the advance button, which just advances whichever uh, item is currently selected by the set button. Pushing the set button cycles through a sequence from normal display mode to the 12 to 24 hour select, then the hour setting, then tens of minutes setting, then units of minutes setting, then seconds reset, then the tilt angle, then back to normal display mode. 
So I'm going to go through this here. So this should be the 12 to 24 hour mode and I can change it to 24 mode or back to 12 by pushing the advance button. Then if I push the set button again it'll be the hours. It's currently 9 p.m. So that's 9 p.m. Then I push the set button again and that's the tens of minutes setting. It's now uh, 20 seven minutes past the hour so I'm gonna have to there are 20 and now it just switched to 28 well it's still 27 according to my um, my phone so that's probably good I'll push this button again I have to go back. I've got 9, 20, and then push advance again to set it to 7. And then um, the seconds reset. It's close enough to being accurate. It just shifted over to the next minute. And then the tilt angle I'm going to leave alone for the moment. That's the tilt angle, I think. Then back to normal display mode, which is nothing at the moment. Now, I think the way it's supposed to work is if you tip it up, 928... So that's apparently seconds. I tip it down, I tip up, I get 928 and 39, 40, 41, 42, 43 seconds. So you have to be ready to read it. 9, 28, and then the seconds until the watch is back at a different angle. And you can change the angle with the accelerometer that's built into here to whatever angle is comfortable uh, for an activation. Okay, there's that monster on my wrist. So it's 9.31, which was a little confusing because it made it look like the minutes and the seconds were the same. So I'm waiting a little longer. 9.31, and now 46, 47, 48, 49 seconds. Another small refinement on this is once the seconds are displaying, the duty cycle changes the longer you hold it in this position. So the amount of time the display is off increases and the amount of time it shows the digits decreases until it's just barely there. Then you have to reactivate it again to continue seeing the seconds. That's a battery saving feature. Cathode Corner provides a schematic um, that uh, can be downloaded from their website. But as with so many of those schematics that are generated by various apparently limited programs, um, it's kind of hard to read, I think. So I've studied the circuit and in the course of that redrawn the schematic according to my own sensibilities and training and uh, I'll go over that now in some detail for those who are so interested in perusing them. Okay, starting with the power supply the watch is powered by a CR2 lithium battery which produces 3 volts nominally. The specifications for the watch says that the battery will last between four and six months of typical use. 
it should last a lot longer if it's not being used although the watch is always running and consuming power but the majority of the power it consumes is when it's actually being used to display the time and if it's just sitting statically in other words keeping track of time but not displaying it it should maybe I'll get a year out of a battery I don't know I don't plan to wear it regularly uh, it'll be mostly for display so hopefully I'll get a good life out of it the battery is fused by a 0.35 amp fuse and on my schematic I'm calling that BAT it looks sort of like a D there but it's a letter B BAT plus that's used elsewhere on the schematic uh, so let's follow that up to here the brains of the watch is a PIC 18LF 722SS microcontroller IC it has three IO ports which are programmable the A port, the B port, and the C port. I didn't check the spec sheets. Um, I suspect these are all 8-bit ports, but at least the A port is being used up through six, its lowest six bits, and the B and the C ports are being used for all eight bits that they have. There are two ground pins on the chip, which are connected to circuit ground just like the negative of the battery and uh, the plus supply the VS or the VCC comes from that BAT plus which is the fused plus side of the battery it passes through a low value 150 ohm resistor to the VCC the spec sheet says that the chip is only pulling about 10 microamps from the battery which is why it can last so long and that's achieved partially because a the pick chip just doesn't use that much power but probably more so because it's running at such a low clock frequency normally you'd run these in the megahertz uh, but the processing needs of the clock are very low you know, nothing even changes on it that's you know much faster than you know a small fraction of a second so relatively low speed so it's running off of a 32.768 kilohertz not megahertz kilohertz crystal and that's connected up according to the spec sheet uh, to the oscillator input and oscillator output pins through a 510k resistor and with um, capacitors from each side of the crystal going to circuit ground one side is a fixed capacitor of 22 picofarads the other side is an adjustable capacitor of 25 picofarads. I presume that's a maximum value. Uh, by tweaking that capacitor, the frequency of the crystal can be adjusted very slightly, and that allows it to be calibrated. I presume that cathode corner hooks up um, a, a frequency counter to this and then dials it in for exactly the desired frequency. I didn't show it on this schematic, but there's actually a test point um, connected to, I think it's it's the oscillator output pin. So uh, this pin here actually has a test point on it uh, where you can hook up test equipment and check the actual clock frequency. But uh, So the, the time base of the watch is based on this crystal and the microcontroller I see also uses that same crystal for its clock so that it can function. The chip is programmable uh, using its internal non-volatile memory and uh, it's connected up with a pull-up resistor from VCC a 32 or 33k resistor to the MCLR uh, pin which apparently has something to do with programming I have not researched that in detail there is a six pin connector where the user can optionally connect it up to a computer through an adapter and monitor the program uh, download it change it if they desire tweak it whatever uh, there are six pins two of them are here uh, it's called uh, jack one 
uh, pins 5 and 6 give you both VCC and this MCLR signal. Uh, there's also two ground pins on pins 2 and 4 and then there are two uh, data pins on pins 1 and 3 which are tied into the B6 and B7 pins of uh, port B. And I should have noted that there's also a 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor tied from VCC to ground. So that's a local filter for the uh, microcontroller after the battery voltage is applied through this resistor to there. That, that point here is filtered or decoupled at least by this uh, capacitor. All of the input signals to the processor are coming in through port A. So let's look at those. First off we have uh, so-called switch 1 which is the set button and then switch 2 which is the advance button. They're both small tactile momentary push buttons. Each one is connected to ground on one side and these squares and diamonds refer to tiny uh, connectors that go between the circuit boards that the watch uses. Um, I've just identified them here as the square is the connector that's called H5 and H6. H5 would be on one side of the connector, H6 is on the other side. The diamond is H3 and H4 and the circle is H1 and H2. So when you see those I'm not going to keep explaining them but that's what they're all about. Functionally you can just ignore that they're there. Um, so the A4 and A5 pins are used as inputs and they can monitor whether these buttons are being pushed or not. There is an accelerometer that's a ADXL335 and that's a uh, manufactured by analog devices by the way. Uh, it has two pins for the power supply VCC and there are four pins that are used for circuit common tied to circuit ground. The accelerometer can register three axes, X, Y, and Z. Only X and Y are used on the watch. The Y output is not used. Uh, those pins are each tied to ground through a 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor and then they go into the A0 and A1 pins where A0 monitors the X axis and A1 monitors the Z axis and by doing so the microcontroller is able to determine what the orientation of the watch is and via the programming that the user can implement or select using the push buttons the controller knows when the watch is in a position that the user wants to trigger the display of the time. Now here's something that's a little bit clever about this, probably to conserve power. The power supply for the accelerometer chip is not connected to the power supply of the circuit. It's actually coming out of pin A3, which is apparently set up as an output pin. All these pins can be programmed to be inputs or outputs. So apparently this is an output pin and when the controller wants to take an accelerometer reading it turns that pin on, powers the chip and then takes a reading and then turns it back off again. Um, I haven't studied the software so I don't know exactly when it's turning it on and off but I'm presuming it's off the majority of the time. There's also another function of that which um, I'll get into in a little bit. So I've covered the battery power supply, the accelerometer, the uh, microcontroller chip, the crystal oscillator and the um, two push buttons and the uh, optional programming port. Let's look at how the microcontroller controls the two Nixie tubes. Now first off, Nixie tubes are just a cold cathode tube. They are not vacuum tubes. 
They are just essentially the same thing as a standard neon bulb. Just with two electrodes, one's a cathode, one's an anode. And if you apply a voltage across between the anode and the cathode on a neon bulb, then the cathode glows with that orange color that it gets based on the plasma inside the tube. And the tube itself is filled with a fairly low pressure uh, gas such as argon or neon. Um, let's say it's neon in this case. I don't know the exact gas chemistry that's used in these particular tubes. So each of these particular Burroughs B58701 or 70L uh, Nixie tubes has 10 cathodes numbered 0 through 9 and those when energized display the numbers 0 through 9. Only one should be energized at a time. The current is DC so it flows in from the anode to or flows in on the anode pin to the anode which is represented by this line here. It's near all the cathodes and in case it wasn't clear from what I said before, each anode is made out of stamped, very thin sheet metal, which is stamped in the shape of the numeral. So there's an anode in the shape of a number 9, in the shape of a number 8, and so on, down through the shape of a, a number 0. Uh, so we have all these cathodes here, and they come out the bottom of the tube, there's a tube for displaying the tens digit, or the most significant digit. There's another tube for displaying the units digit, or least significant digit. Uh, because the units digit must always be able to display any number between 0 and 9, all of its cathodes are connected to the circuit. Because the tens digit only needs to be able to display the numbers 0 through 5, only those cathodes are connected. The cathodes for 6, 7, 8, and 9 are not connected. And that's of course because uh, whether it's seconds, minutes, or hours, you never have more than a 5 in the unit's position. 59 would be the largest number you would display for seconds, minutes, or in the case of hours, a 24 would be the largest number you would display. Um, and also the two displays here, the two Nixie tubes, are multiplexed. So only one is actually activated at any given moment. But it's done frequently enough, alternating between them, that the human eye's persistence of vision uh, regards them as both being on at the same time, or perceives them as being on at the same time. So even though these are multiplexed, because there are enough pins on the microcontroller to individually drive each cathode that's used, um, the multiplexing takes place on this side, not on the anode side. In other words, a more conventional multiplexing scheme might be to have all of the cathodes tied together, so cathode 0 on the units and cathode 0 on the tens would be tied to the same electrical point, and the same thing for for 1, 2, 3, and 4, all the way up through 9, and then the anodes would be multiplexed. But on this watch, the anodes are common, and each cathode is driven independently, so it's they're multiplexed on the cathode side. The actual signals are, num are called U0 through U9, that's for the units, and T0 through T5 for the tens. Those make their way to this bus. I could have just drawn these as lines going be, uh, between the, these ICs and the Nixie tubes, but they crisscross a lot, so I thought it'd be simpler just to draw them like this in a bus style. Uh, they actually get scrambled a little bit. That's because the circuit board is very small, and there's not a lot of provision on it for having a lot of foils crisscross each other to get 
where they need to go so instead the foils were routed in the most direct expedient fashion between the Nixie tubes and the driver ICs and that results in um, for example U6 and U7 being on C1 and C2 here and T0 then T5 then T1, 4, 3 and 2 they're a little bit scrambled but the software makes up for that it knows which one goes with um, which digit. The input sides of these two ICs which are again the digit drivers are going directly to the B port and the C port of the microcontroller so each of those pins are used going through these two chips and on to uh, the two Nixie tubes. Now if you add them up you've got 10 signals for the units and 6 signals for the tens which is 16 points which is exactly the number of pins there are on ports B and C of the microcontroller and since these are octal display drivers each of them can accommodate eight signals so the two of them gives you the 16 as well every resource is, is used from the controller through the display driver to the uh, re requisite pins of the Nixie tubes now let's look at these display drivers these are Toshiba parts TD62083AFNs Here's a sketch I made showing what's internal to these, just using um, B1 and B2 as an example. That's two out of the eight signals that can go through this particular display driver chip. The other one also has a B1 and a B2, but we're just looking at a typical B1 and B2 here for the sake of uh, illustration and description. So what you have inside is the B pins just go through a, a resistor into the base of a transistor. In reality these are Darlington pair transistors, not the simple transistors I've shown, but functionally they're just like I showed them. Just be aware that internally they're actually a Darlington transistor where I showed a simple NPN transistor. Um, a signal applied here will turn on the respective transistor. The transistor then is connected, the transistor collectors are connect, connected to the C pins. So B1, which is for base 1, goes to the C1 pin, which is collector 1. You can see how the nomenclature goes with the base and the collector of the internal transistors. And, and likewise, B2 affects this transistor, you can call it transistor 2, whose collector comes out on the C2 pin that makes these display drivers current syncing drivers. The current will come from the display, come in the C pins, go through the transistors, and, and out the E pin. Why is it called the E pin? Because it's connected to the emitters of the transistors. Now whereas each transistor has its own base and its own collector, all of the emitters are tied together to a single pin called E. In addition, each of the transistors has a diode connected to its cathode, and those diodes are connected on their common cathodes to a pin on the IC called COM for common. So again, if you want to turn on a particular display segment or digit, you'll turn on the appropriate B, the microcontroller does that, turns on its respective transistor, that provides a current path from the C pin through the transistor to the E pin and therefore that segment of the uh, Nixie tube will light up. Um, something is applied to the COM pin and that functions with these diodes to clamp the voltage on the transistors. These are these display drivers are rated for about 50 volts as a nominal maximum so you don't want to go much over 50 volts but if you keep it in the ballpark of 50 volts then they're good and they will not be damaged. Um, now that brings me to talk about the Nixie tubes a little bit here. Um, 
they require about 180 volts to strike, as it's called. In other words, to go from not being lit up to being lit up. In mixy tube parlance, that's called striking. Uh, so you have to apply 180 volts to the anodes with a grounded cathode for that cathode to strike. But once it's striked, then and, and currents flowing from the anode to the, the cathode that has been struck and is therefore illuminated. And once that current is flowing, then you don't need the 180 volts anymore. You can reduce it to 140 volts and it'll display just fine. If you reduce it to, say, 120 volts, then that cathode will be turned off and it will no longer illuminate. So we're really talking about three voltages there, more or less. Um, you've got the, uh, the blanking voltage of 120 volts. You've got the steady state voltage of 140 volts, and you have the striking voltage of 180 volts. So going back, we know we're going to apply 180 volts initially to the anodes, and let's say there's no voltage drop um, anywhere else in here. That means that you'd have 180 volts applied to the C pins of the display drivers, which we know by looking at this means that the collectors of these transistors is going to have 180 volts on it. That's the maximum voltage it's likely to have. Well, these are only rated for 50 volts thereabouts, so it'll blow these up. That's what these diodes are for. If you connect this common pin to something besides ground, let's say we connected it to a 170 volt voltage source, and you try to apply 180 to the Nixie tube, and assuming there's no voltage drop in the Nixie tube all the way up to here, you would be trying to apply 180 volts, but there's 170 volts on the other side of the diode. The diode becomes forward biased, and therefore the voltage can only be, uh, assuming these are sil uh, normal silicon um, diodes, uh, the voltage can only be about 0.7 volts higher than whatever voltage is on the cathode. So it would be limiting it in the example I gave to uh, 170.7 volts. Um, but I'll get back to this later. We're actually applying a much lower voltage to the common pin of these driver ICs, thereby limiting the collector voltages to something that these these transistors are able to tolerate indefinitely with no, no damage. So let's move on to the power supply circuit. So we need a high voltage uh, source. Oh, I should mention that um, this PIC controller is perfectly happy running at 3 volts. I think it's okay running at 5 volts, for example, but it's designed to be able to run uh, on 3 volts or even a bit less, which is why it's able to run off of a 3 volt battery with no power supply circuit in between the battery and the, the microcontroller chip. Actually, it's even a bit, bit less than 3 volts, assuming the battery is fresh because there's going to be a tiny tiny voltage drop through this 150 ohm resistor. But at 10 microamps, that voltage drop is minuscule. So anyway, um, we need to take that 3 volts, or even a bit less if the battery drains down a bit, and we need to turn that into, say, 180 volts, because the neon bulbs need it. So how does that happen? Well, we uh, come out of the battery here, and instead of this connection, which goes up to the microcontroller, we come down here. We have a filter capacitor, 100 microfarads, and that's applied to the VN power supply pin of this LT1308B-S8 which, by the way, is a, a linear technology. Is it linear technology or linear devices? I think the LT stands for linear technology. 
uh, certainly a company that makes a lot of specialty chips. Uh, so this chip is sort of a everything in one chip voltage switching uh, power supply controller chip and it can be used in a lot of different ways. It's being used in a fairly simple way here. So we've applied three volts to the V input. There's provision for an LBI and an LBO which is not being used here. There's a shutdown pin so the chip can be made to work or not work based on a signal applied to its shutdown input and that comes from the A2 pin on the microcontroller. So the microcontroller can decide when it needs to have high voltage or not. So quite obviously if you're just sitting there with the watch laying on a table, a tiny amount of power comes, comes out of the battery and keeps the microcontroller running so that it can keep track of the time. But when you pick up the watch or if it's been on your wrist and you tip the watch to the desired angle that triggers the display, the microcontroller knows that, that it's time to turn on the display. It turns on the A2 pin, which comes over here, and um, is it, did I miss it up? Yeah, it's the A2 pin, and that controls the shutdown. I did not check to see if this is positive acting or negative acting. It may be negative acting either way by changing the voltage on the shutdown pin the microcontroller can decide whether we generate high voltage or not. And this is the main power consuming part of the circuit, so obviously you don't want to have that run except when you need to actually have the display working. There's also a VC pin. I think that's uh, an internal clock that this has, and that's controlled by this resistor-capacitor combination uh, connected to ground. The chip is also connected to ground via its pin 4, and based upon its, in, its clock, its speed of operation, and whether it's been shut down or, or enabled, which is the opposite of being shut down, it turns the switch uh, output on and off rapidly. Well, the positive of the battery is connected to one side of this transformer, one side of the primary of the transformer, pin 1 here, and the other side of the primary is connected to ground through the SW, the switched output, in other words. Just think about there being a transistor from here to ground that can be turned on and off. So the, the chip turns that transistor on and off, and that results in current flowing from the battery through the winding through the internal transistor to ground. It builds up a magnetic field in the primary and then when the transistor turns off that magnetic field collapses generating a higher voltage and uh, coupled with this uh, shot key diode here to ground you have a situation where that kick, that inductive kick that's produced by uh, energizing and then de-energizing this coil uh, Produce, that's energy that can be transferred to the secondary winding. And the secondary winding is a 12 times ratio to the primary. And the way it works out is you get about 60 volts developed across the secondary winding because of the oscillatory nature of the primary. And I should note that with the RC values here, this is running at about 600 kilohertz. So not a terribly fast frequency, but it's not, I don't think, that unusual for a switching power supply. Now the advantage of a switching power supply is that it allows a fair amount of current or power to be controlled, um, but doing it with very small components. So you don't need a big transformer. This is going to be a tiny little transformer. Uh, now one side of its secondary is connected to ground, and then we have, again, 60 volts thereabouts developed from the other side of the secondary winding to ground. Now let's see what happens there. Well, this is a voltage tripler. And just uh, to give it in a quick 
and dirty nutshell uh, description when the transformer is trying to have current go in this direction it's on that half of its waveform it can't have anything flowing in this direction because this diode is reverse biased but when the uh, other side of the waveform comes around then the current is trying to go this way and it's able to go through this diode and it charges this capacitor up to 60 volts from this side to this side uh, so you have 60 volts across that capacitor as a result of current coming out of the transformer secondary and through this diode and of course it helps a lot that both the other side of the capacitor and the other side of the uh, transformer winding are both electrically common and tied to ground so what happens on the other side of the waveform now let's say the you're on you flip to the other side of the waveform and now the current is trying to go this way um, well it can't go through this loop because this diode is reverse biased but this diode is forward biased and therefore it wants to develop 60 volts across this capacitor but what's in series with it is a capacitor that's already charged up to 60 volts from the other half of the waveform so we take the 60 volts from this capacitor and the 60 volts being developed by the secondary of the transformer we add them together and this capacitor charges up to that so you have 120 volts from here to ground and then when the transformer flips around and goes the other way uh, on the waveform now the current's trying to go this way again well it can go through this capacitor and it can go through this diode meanwhile it's also charging up C6 again but now it's also trying to charge up C5 but it's also in series with this capacitor which just got charged up to 120 volts a split second ago so we add the 125 or the 120 volts to the 60 volts from the transformer and we charge this capacitor up to 180 volts so you see how that works every half cycle some part or part of this gets charged up and depending how far along it is from the left to the right it gets charged up to the transformer voltage plus whatever the sections to the left were charged up to so that's how we end up with 180 volts here now this point here which is 60 volts I drew it coming off this diode but it's this whole point in the circuit 60 volts there's a 33k resistor and a 51 volt Zener diode to ground so this point here develops um, 51 volts and that goes past here it does not connect here it just passes through and that's called V clamp it's the clamping voltage and sure enough it comes back here to the two display driver chips on their common pins which you may recall goes to the internal diodes and therefore when the uh, any of the cathodes are conducting on the Nixie tubes regardless of how much voltage drop there is out there these transistors never see more than 51 volts so that's what's going on there you have high voltages on the Nixie tubes but you don't have higher than 51 and change volts uh, on the transistors so they're fine with that so that's what this part of the power supply is doing so we have this 180 volts up here and that goes to the so-called V anode or anode voltage which sure enough is applied to the anodes of both Nixie tubes so that's where the 180 volts is coming from and how it's getting there now we have this big voltage divider it's comprised of two resistors each 510k which adds up to um, 1.2 megs and it's only um, done this way instead of using just a 1.2 meg resistor the tiny little resistors that are being used on this watch have a voltage limit in other words if you apply more voltage across them it might just 
sh jump across the gap from one side of the resistor to the other because of their tiny size. So because of that, uh, there are two resistors used in series to get the desired uh, 1.2 mega ohms but each resistor only sees half of the voltage and it's within their specifications. Then this resistor voltage divider continues with the 7.5k resistor and finally a 150 ohm resistor to ground. So it's a resistor voltage divider comprised of a 1.2 meg resistor, a 7.5k resistor, and a 150 ohm resistor. And of course we're going to develop voltages um, because the 180 volts causes a current to flow from here down to ground and you get voltage drops across all those resistors based on that current and it so happens that nominally this point has about 1.21 volts on it. Uh, so that's the nominal feedback voltage and it's connected to a filter ca capacitor to ground and then it comes up here and it's tied to the feedback pin of the switching power supply chip. Based on the voltage here, the chip adjusts uh, its output on the switching output to fine-tune the amount of energy that's transferred through this transformer and therefore the actual voltage that's developed out here. So if this voltage is a little bit higher than 180 volts, then this voltage will be a bit more than 1.21 volts. It'll be sensed by the feedback pin and adjustment will be made to the switching circuit and it'll bring the voltage back down. Vice versa, if the voltage is a little too low, it will adjust to boost it back up to 180 volts. So this is a regulated voltage. So that gives us our 180 volts, right? Now I mentioned before that these Nixie tubes are happiest striking at 180 volts but then having more like 140 volts across them for the duration of the time you have them illuminated. So I also mentioned that once the tube has been struck then current is flowing through it and these are nominally uh, going to be working at about 2 milliamps of current flowing from the anode to whichever cathode is is being um, connected through to ground. So you're looking for a 2 milliamp current and that current um, has to go somewhere, right? It's coming in from the anode, it's going through the Nixie tube, it's going into the display driver chip and let's say it's this one here. Let's say we're turning on uh, the cathode that's connected to C1 on the lower chip comes in here, the current comes in, goes through the collector of the transistor, out the emitter of the transistor, and then finally to the emitter pin or the E-pin. Those are both tied together on both display driver chips and that comes down here and it comes in on the V-sense or voltage sense uh, point of this divider and it goes through this 150 ohm resistor to ground. So once the Nixie tube has struck, then you have two milliamps coming through here. Before it strikes, you don't have any milliamps coming this way. Well, you add that to whatever current would normally be coming down this divider from the 180 volts up here, and that means an increased current through this 150 ohm resistor, which means the voltage dropped across it is a little bit higher and that in turn means that the voltage up here is a little bit higher just a tiny amount well it's higher than the nominal 1.21 volts certainly I don't know how high it goes I could do the math but I'm too lazy I think I calculated it out to be closer to 1.4 volts but that may be a mistake anyway it's a little bit higher well now this chip over here sees that as the uh, the voltage being too high. The feedback voltage is not what it should be so it backs off up here and reduces it to about 140 volts. Once it does so then you're back to a stasis point where you're getting the requisite uh, 1.21 volts here again. So by that clever scheme 
of mixing the two voltages in the bottom of this resistor divider, we can automatically get it to back off from 180 volts to 140 volts as soon as the, the cathode on the Nixie tube has struck and is therefore illuminating and passing current through it. Well, there's one more thing I'm going to talk about um, on the power supply, and that is um, there's this extra resistor, 33K, which is connected from the A3 pin down to the feedback pin. And while I don't know exactly what's going on there, my understanding is that it's a fine tweak having to do with blanking the display. So we know that the controller turns its A3 pin on and off at different points in its repeating cycle to take readings from the accelerometer. When it does that, this point is either energized or it's connected to ground. So that is obviously connecting this side of this resistor to an energized point or to ground. And that changes what's going on down here a little bit. Essentially it messes with the feedback voltage slightly and the end result is that the regulator once again makes an adjustment to the switching part of the circuit such that the voltage here drops down to about 120 volts. So that's got something to do with blanking the display, but I haven't worked out a timing diagram and all that stuff to see exactly when that happens. But apparently it has to do with when you're not actually driving the display and you want it to be off as part of the multiplexing scheme or just when the display is supposed to be off in general. Um, so Again, we have a switching power supply that de delivers three different voltages depending on what's going on at that split second in the overall cycle of the clock that it does repetitiously all the time whenever it's supposed to be um, displaying something. Pretty clever circuit. Minimum number of parts and uh, clearly it works well. I think I've covered all of the aspects of the operation of this circuit now, so I hope you found that part to be interesting. Okay, continuing with the Nixie watch, I want to come up with a display holder for my desk. It's going to emulate my wrist, so um, Yep, it's keeping good time since I said it a few days ago. Anyway, so with this watch standing in for my Nixie watch, I envision something that will be about the shape of my wrist, probably made out of wood, and it'll pivot like that to turn the watch on and display the time, and then pivot by gravity back to horizontal, which means the pivot point will be offset from the center of mass. Um, and that should be easily done. Um, I'm thinking I'll just use some sort of plywood for this, some scraps. I already made a sketch of sorts. It's a little faint. Um, so this shape would be about the same size and shape as my wrist cross-section. I might make it a little larger so there's uh, less of the strap dangling down. Make the pivot point to the front, this is the front. Put a little extension on there so I can push down on this to pivot that up. The watch will be on here, the strap will go around. Um, this will be sort of a front view. There has to be something on the side to uh, support the pivot, but I don't want it on both sides because then I'll have to actually buckle and unbuckle the watch to get it off, and I don't really want to do that. So I'm going to make it one-sided. Then there will be a base, 
Uh, I'm not sure yet if I'll use a metal rod or a piece of dowel rod for the pivot. Here's a side view without all the other stuff on it. I want to store my two spare tubes inside the wrist, if you will. Um, I just envisioned boring a couple holes in there and putting the tubes right in there. Otherwise, they'll probably get lost or put somewhere where I can't find them when I want them. Okay, I think I have it figured out. This is the cross section of the wrist, if you will. This is the actual wrist area, and that's sized to have enough room for the two Nixie tube, spare Nixie tubes, that is, to reside inside of it with a sixteenth of an inch brass plate inset into the bottom and the pivot point off to the front of it left in this view that gives the watch band uh, sitting up on top of here a good outer periphery to um, to not have a lot of extra strap hanging off there and I figured a three-eighths of an inch clearance for the buckle on the bottom here's a front view this is this here is this. Once again, there's a cutout for the Nixie tubes in the middle. And there's a base made out of half inch plywood. There's going to be a 16th inch thick brass plate on the left. Some cut off of here. <clears throat> and that'll be the same thing that's used for the bottom here, which will add a little more weight to it. It's fairly heavy. Um, a brass screw will go through the plate and into a tapped hole in a brass rod, probably a quarter inch OD brass rod. If I can't find a brass rod, I'll just use a steel rod, it'll be fine, but um, I'll try to get a, uh, a brass rod from my stock. I think I have some somewhere. And then a couple of um, screws, I didn't draw them yet, but there will be um, three times brass screw. These need to have a um, either sheet metal screws or more likely wood screws so they'll go into the wood. If I can't find anything in my stock that does that, I'll just use some of the, the regular brass machine screws I know I have and I'll just drill and tap the wood so there's a solution for everything. Uh, probably for extra strength on this, um, once I get the brass rod tapped, assuming I use a brass rod, I'll put the screw in and I might just touch it with a little bit of uh, plumbing solder to uh, freeze it in there or maybe I'll just use CA glue for that. Um, anyway, so I have a scrap of this three-quarter inch, well it's a metric or something, it's a little bit less than three-quarter of an inch, Baltic birch that's big enough to make these pieces. Um, so I have it penciled out here, this dash line here and this dash line here represent the thickness of a middle piece and then there will be two sandwiching pieces so the the wrist part of it will be made out of a laminate of three pieces. The middle part will be cut short before I glue them together to make a recess for the brass strip that will go in to hold the Nixie tubes in so they don't fall out. That's uh, shown in cross section here. And that will allow it to be recessed easily without having to do routing or anything like that because it will just be the middle of the three sandwich layers that has the, uh, the recess and that will be easily cut or sanded before putting them together. Uh, let's see, oh yeah, um, the side closest to the pivot will be shaped a little differently. It'll be shaped with this protrusion coming out the front 
So pushing down on that will cause the whole thing to pivot around the axle, but to avoid strain on the small support area here, I'll be pushing down here, and these two layers won't have that protrusion. Actually, I can't have that protrusion um, uh, for the um, these two layers because the watch band has to come around there, and I want to be able to slip the watch band off to the right, which is why there's no support on the right. So I can buckle it up to the closest fit, slide it on, and the watch will just sit on there, and then I'll push down on this part to cause it to pivot up. The bottom here is at 45 degrees, and I actually made a little model of it there, but it'll essentially pivot up like that, and that will be enough to trigger the watch to display, and it'll be a good viewing angle. So that should be fairly easy to make. Okay, I've got plenty of wood on that scrap. The uh, piece with the lever on it will fit in there. In here, I'll cut it out first and then cut it to contour. And the two pieces for the middle and the bottom will fit here and here. And then the base will be cut out from this section and after I rough cut the greater dimension, I'm going to resaw it to be three quarters or a half of an inch. I'll just pick a spot where I have the uh, good looking outer grain, probably right around where my fingernail is there. Resaw it to that. And um, yeah, I don't need a big Frankenstein shoe three quarter inch base on this, I don't think. And I'd drafted it out as half inch anyway. I definitely have plenty of brass. Now I have to go looking for suitable screws and some threaded rod. Okay, I've glued my three blocks together. I have the recessed middle part and the longer part on the left and the blocks are all just oversized. But, um, well, putting this one down here, it's plenty big. Now I flip it over. It's plenty big as well. Well, I screwed up on this. I forgot to make one cut before I laminated the whole thing up. I was going to just laminate these two, cut them out, then laminate this piece and uh, with it already cut out and just align the pieces up and then fine tune the contours. But now it's too late, so I'm going to have to think of something else to do here. There are different kludgy ways of doing this, I just haven't decided which one's the best yet. I don't really want to start all over again either. Well, by some bandsaw acrobatics, I've been able to rough out the shape, so that's good. Now I'm going to try and use my strip sander to round this out. Okay, the piece is shaped, contoured, hopefully this uh, brass piece will fit in there, and it does, so that's good. I want to put a little bit of um, filler in these holes here. A bit of Baltic birch sawdust I made with my Dremel sanding drum and a scrap of the Baltic birch and a little bit of wood glue and we'll make our putty.
And uh, I think while I'm sitting here doing this, I'm going to drill the holes for the Nixie tubes and drill the pivot point hole. So, just have to make sure I know where my centers are on that. Okay, there are the holes. I had to do um, several stabs because of the amount of material coming out of the deep holes and I allowed this one to get slightly misaligned so it's a little boogered up but it'll be covered up by the brass plate so I'm not worried about that tubes go down in there with uh, I don't know three thirty seconds of an inch or something clearance before they hit the plate so that should work so I've cut the uh, brass rod um, to length slightly longer than the actual desired length. I've chucked it up in my metal lathe um, for the express purpose of chewing up the end of it. It's very clear that whoever produces these things just shears them off. So I need to um, get this guy going to make sure that the end is absolutely square. Okay, I have my brass rod cut square, I sanded it on the lathe, I've got the uh, screw tapped into it, and it fits very nicely into the hole with just enough slop that it'll move freely. Now I've got to, well, I'll do the rest of the brass work tomorrow, it's getting late. Um, but. I've got this piece made. I have to make the side piece that goes between the base and here, or between the base and the brass rod at least. I have all the screws. I've found various things that'll work. So in the morning I'll sand this guy up. I'll get some um, uh, varnish on these and uh, do the rest of the metal work. Okay, coat of varnish applied. All right, the next morning, the varnish is dry. I've given it a light sanding. It's nice and smooth, both parts. now to do a little bit more metal work. I've made a pattern out of paper for the uh, side bracket, which I just made a small revision to. I wanted to lower the upper part a bit. So it'll sit up above there. There's enough room for the uh, wristwatches buckle on the band to fit below it and tip up like that. And now I just have to cut that shape out of this piece of 16th inch brass. That'll be the fun part. Alright, the metal bracket has been mounted to the base. 
and the pivot rod is mounted. It does not go all the way through the piece. Now during some test fitting it seemed like this had not too much friction. Now with the way of the watch I think it'll pull it down but I think I'm gonna well, it's working better now. Get those last couple pieces of sawdust out of the hole or whatever. Yeah, I think that'll work. <clears throat> now, the only thing I didn't do yet is I was debating what kind of bumper I wanted on here to keep it from tipping back too far. Originally, I was just going to make that out of a piece of wood. Then I decided to make it a little more adjustable after the fact, so I think I'm just going to put some sort of a little ad hoc piece on the bottom there, probably right on the base. There we go, just a little piece of dowel rod cut to size and super glued in place. have a uh, rectangle marked out on a piece of scrap red felt. Put a little bit of rubber cement on the back of the felt and also on the back of the, the base. You may ask why it's different colored is because I was trying to get it down through this white layer here um, and I didn't do it quite evenly. And that's on there now. I always try to make these um, pads on the bottom of things be a little bit smaller so they're not immediately apparent that they're there. You don't see them kind of sticking out from underneath, in other words. And there is the uh, brass plate on the bottom covering up the Nixie tube storage holes. I pushed some round felt pads down into the bottom of the holes. And I'm just debating about which is the wet, best way to put the Nixie tubes in. This will normally be the bottom and it'll be bouncing down on that point um, which means on the leads if I put it in that way. I'm actually thinking the strongest part of the tube is up here in many ways. So maybe I should put the tubes in like that. With the felt in there, there's just enough springiness so they shouldn't move around any. I think that's the way I'll do it. Those tubes aren't even rattling around in there now. I think that felt made all the difference. Okay, so the watch is strapped on the artificial wrist, and as I expected, it's um, on the last hole. I tried to calculate it that way. Actually, it was just a tad tight, but partly that's because I have some a little bit sharper bends here, and the uh, band material is slightly springy, so I think that. Uh, It'll work out.
if I tip it all the way up, then it's balanced pretty well. The weight is forward of the axle, so um, it tends to stay up there, and that was by design. But if I just bring it up to demonstrate it, like that, then it'll return to horizontal on its own. So I'm pretty pleased with the way that came out. Okay, here's where I've decided to put it on my desk, at least temporarily. I might move it somewhere else later. It's small.